Arunang karuna tarangitakshi Drita pasang kusha pushpabana chapam Animadi biravritam mayukhai Raham mityeva vibhavaye bhavani Kameshwarastra nirdabdha sabhanda sura shunyaka Namaste and welcome to another episode of Sri Lalita Sahasranama. So we're progressing slowly because these names are very deep. Uh, they're not easy to explain uh, or short in their meaning. Uh, they're deep in their meaning and long in the explanation. In fact, we could make maybe one hour video on each one of these names. Of course, nobody's going to watch that, so <laughs> we don't do that. Anyway, this name, Kameshwarastra, huh? in the last video we talked about how she destroyed Bandasura's army with Shiva's weapon. Uh, and Shiva's weapon is all powerful. It can destroy the whole universe. So it just depends on how it's targeted. So Bandasura was so powerful, he needed a weapon of that strength to overcome him. So this name, Kameshwarastra, refers to that weapon, the Pashupati weapon, Pashupati Astra. Nirdagda Sabandasura Sunyaka. This weapon destroyed the entire city, the capital city of Bandasura. Not only did it kill him and his whole army, but it destroyed his capital city, which is called Shunyaka. <laughs> Shunyaka. Shunya, of course, means nothing, empty. So it destroyed it completely. There was nothing left. It was gone. And it also... That's on the literal level. It also means that when the ego and mind are destroyed by the weapon of detachment, then one enters emptiness, nothingness. And of course, this is the realm of Shiva. Hum. If one can reach this, then Maya becomes his servant. And of course, what one wants to do in that condition is to transcend form completely, to reach the formless, shunyata. Uh, so this is really a wonderful name. Uh, the Pashupati Astra, of course, belongs to the Pashupati form of Shiva. Pashu means animals or animalistic humans. <laughs> So he is the pati, he is the master or the father or the husband of the animalistic humans. They are under his direction. So Pashupati is a, a lower form of Shiva than Kameshwara. Kameshwara is the highest form, actually. So Kameshwara Astra, this is the Astra, the weapon of detachment of renunciation, of silence. Very profound, very deep meaning here. So what it's saying in the uh, metaphorical interpretation is that to defeat the ego and the mind, which are what trap us in this material existence, that one has to use the weapon of detachment of renunciation. The realization that this whole relative existence is nothing but maya. Huh? And the reason it's maya, the reason why it doesn't really exist, 
is that it's temporary. That which really exists, Ramana Maharshi says, that which really exists has three attributes. It's eternal, it's complete in itself, in a self, self uh, standing, it's not dependent on anything else. And it's full of bliss, it shines, it's effulgent. Huh? Sat, chit, ananda. Huh? Because we live in the world of asat, meaning temporary. Nischit, <laughs> meaning not conscious. Huh? And nirananda, not blissful. In fact, it's dukkha, it's suffering. So to get out of this trap, this material existence, relative world, then we have to use these weapons, the Pashupatiastra and the Kameshwarastra. Now, the Kameshwarastra, what, what means Kameshwara? Kameshwara means the form of Brahman that desires to be many, because this is the original desire. It says in the Upanishads, Brahman said, I am one, let me become many. So this is the original creative impetus that gives rise to the relative existence. Now, of course, what gives rise to something can also be used to destroy it, just to use it in the opposite way. So the same potency of Kameshwara that gives rise to the relative existence also destroys it at the end. So in the pralaya, at the end of the universe, he turns this around. I am many, now let me become one. And so this is very destructive to this temporary world. And really it means the end, uh, the pralaya, maha pralaya. And after this, then Shiva and Shakti absorb into each other. They become one, and this is Brahman. Of course, Brahman exists all the time. <laughs> In fact, only Brahman exists, really, because this is the unconditioned and permanent being that is behind all other manifestations. And the symptom of this Brahman is self-consciousness, self-knowledge. I know that I am. How do I know that I am? I am conscious of being conscious. I am aware of being aware. And before awareness, there has to be being. Huh? Descartes got it wrong. He said, I think, therefore I am. No, no. You are, therefore you think. <laughs> Let's get the order correct. Huh? If you don't exist, how can you think? How can you be aware of anything? So this is the fundamental flaw in the Western philosophy, the dualist philosophy, huh? that it says that dualism is the permanent state of the existence and the Vedas don't buy that at all. There are even some so-called Vedic philosophies, such as the fanatical so-called bhakti, which isn't really bhakti because it's based on rules and regulations, uh, that says that dualism is the ultimate state and that one has a permanent spiritual identity where one has a relationship with God well, what is the meaning of permanent in a world, the whole world is temporary. Huh? So the maximum uh, duration of existence in this world is until the Mahapralaya. But why not just say that? They, they create a false standard. They create a false uh, level of beingness that doesn't really exist. And then they call this Vaikuntha. <laughs> without anxiety. But actually, it is sakunta, because then one has to please one's devotional deity, 
And if not, he can lose his standing. See, one has to please, one has to serve, one has to be in a proper relationship, and so on. The concept of Brahman transcends all of this. See, it's beyond rules and regulations because pure love is beyond rules. It has no limits. A rule is a limit. It has to be like this, it has to be like that. But real devotion is creative. It creates a unique relationship, a unique set of activities and pastimes that have never existed before. And that only the devotee, only that individual could offer to God. So this is what God wants to see. Wow, something new. <laughs> something unique. Because God creates each and every being, each and every soul, uniquely. With a particular bias toward a specific relationship. This is called rasa, rasa tattva. So when one realizes one's rasa, then he goes beyond the restrictions of the scriptures, beyond the rules and regulations. I mean, look, for example, at the relationship between Krishna and the gopis. They broke every rule. Huh? They took intoxication. They had illicit sex. <laughs> they were even playing gambling games out in the forest, games of chance, huh? and the stakes are very high. <laughs> So try to understand, real devotion cannot be hemmed in by rules. In fact, rules kill devotion because they say you have to be a copycat. You have to just be exactly like these other people. Follow them. You can't be original. You can't be unique. But wait a minute. God doesn't make a mold and then turn out beings in mass production. I mean, maybe on the level of insects or plants, he does. But as far as human beings, each one is unique and special. So real devotion means beyond all the rules and regulations. You make your own path. And then beyond even that is the meditation. The meditation is ultimately on the void, shunyata, and when one realizes this void, he realizes, I am the subject. I am Shiva, Shivoham. At that point, Maya becomes subservient. Huh? Actually, Maya is subservient to all of us because we're all Brahman, actually. The problem is we're covered over with these desires. We want to have a body. We want to live in a world. Huh? We want to do all this stuff that requires bodily existence. So because of these desires, when we leave this body and we attain the state of Shiva, then Maya says, okay, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to go here and take this kind of body and I want to go there. Uh, maybe we don't say it, vocalize it like that, but we have the vasanas, we have the mental tendencies that push us in that direction. So Maya says, okay, yeah, here you go. Here's another body. Yeah, and now you have to take birth, go through all this karma again. See, this is our ignorance. This is our stupidity. Now, before I close, I want to say something about astrology. And I kept it until the end for it, because oh, it's just for the people who are intelligent, who actually listen to the whole video. I always put the good stuff at the end. <laughs> so now, in the month of May, beginning actually yesterday, Mercury is going to go behind the sun. Now, Mercury means intellect. And in mundane astrology, the meaning of Mercury's transit behind the sun is that the intellect gets overshadowed by ego. So during the next month, we're going to see a lot of people taking hasty actions Mercury is moving very fast during this time. And he's in Aries. Huh? <laughs> Boy, Aries is a problematic sign.
very enthusiastic, but not very, not very bright. <laughs> Athletes come under Aries. Huh? They have strong Aries. So you have a tendency during the next month, we all have tendency to take snap decisions and act precipitately. And that would be wrong. That would be dangerous. It's better to step back, try to take the big view and wait until everything is really clear, like toward the end of the month. So the esoteric meaning though is very different. The esoteric meaning is that the mind is being overshadowed by Brahman, or actually outshone. Huh? That Brahman, the sun represents Brahman. So Brahman is eclipsing the darkness of the mind. And the image is like a sunrise. And of course, the uh, scripture talks about the sunrise, that when the sun rises, when it comes over the horizon, it's a red color, huh? like the Bindu. It's a red color. And this is the uh, compassion of Shakti. So if we can, in this next month, devote ourselves to meditation instead of action, instead of rushing out there, uh, some of the uh, people are very, very impatient to end the lockdown. But wait a minute, the danger still isn't over. And I think people are gonna find this out the hard way. So better not to just rush out there and try to resume so-called normal activities, which are actually frenetic race. <laughs> but uh, stay in seclusion as much as possible and meditate and allow the sun of Brahman to rise over the, the darkness of the mind, the horizon of the mind, and dissipate the darkness of ignorance leading to complete self-realization. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung.